Hello, welcome to Tea with TPS. It is a conversation with thought leaders of India and abroad. Today we have a very distinguished scientist with us, a newcomer to Trivandrum as the director of the Rajiv Gandhi Center for Biotechnology. But he has been in the scientific field for a long time and he has a very distinguished reputation as a scientist. He started off as a physicist, but then moved on to chemistry and biology. And he has occupied several research positions in different uh, institutions, he won several awards, and uh, he even has uh, some patents, even internationally. And I believe some of them, two of them are going to be commercialized very soon. Uh, he is known as an accomplished scientist, interdisciplinary uh, research leader by every in the scientific world. And his parents are from Kerala, but he studied in Bangalore and also Cornell University, where he's now a, a visiting professor. I heard this morning a lecture he gave at the Navrachana University in Vadodara on Raman spectroscopy and its applications in chemistry and biology. This, I believe, is a specialization. We all know about Raman, but even many years after him, his effect and uh, his theories still dominate a large degree, a large section of scientific study and research. So you are really the impersonation of that uh, great scientist we had, and I'm glad to see that you are bringing it into practice in your day-to-day -day research and day-to-day -day contribution. Uh, the Rajiv Gandhi's Center for Biotechnology is now at the center of the fight against COVID. And that's exactly why I would call you are a man of the moment. Because you have just arrived and you came in the middle of the pandemic and must have been completely drawn into the various activities relating to the Rajiv Gandhi Center. So welcome. Thank you very much for spending a few minutes with me today. Thank you, Ambassador uh, Srinivasan. Uh, it is indeed a proud moment for me to get introduced to you and speak with you because I've heard a lot about you and you have contributed excellently in the literature uh, and uh, also you write non-fiction uh, fiction stories and various other uh, popularization uh, of people. Uh, so thank you very much and it is a, a honor to be on this platform. Uh, well, thank you. I'm an evangelist for international relations. My, yes. my mission in life is to get as many people as possible interested in international relations and also foreign service. That's why I run an institution where we coach candidates for the civil services. So wow. many people have now started joining the foreign service from Kerala because of yes, I, I see that. And effect, as they call it. <laughs> Correct. But before we go to our conversation, uh, Dr. Marana, let me uh, mention the sad loss that we had today. That we are talking on the 17th of September, Friday. This morning, one of our very famous scientists, a uh, proud son of Kerala, passed away, Dr. Panu Padmanabha. He was also a physicist like you, but you moved away. But he, I think, stayed as a physicist. And uh, I have had the privilege of hearing him because he has come and given some lectures in, uh, in Kerala. So it was a great shock for all of us that this happened today. And he was, he was quite young from the standards of these days. He was only 64. So he also was given an award by the Kerala government for scientists from, from Kerala who have done well internationally. So would you like to say a word about him? Definitely, and uh, it's really a shocking moment for us physicists uh, because uh, he's too young to have even uh, departed. Uh, I wish uh, his uh, family uh, my condolences, and uh, I would also like to pray for his uh, um, soul. 
but uh, I wanted to emphasize that what he did for uh, theoretical physics and cosmology is uh, phenomenal. And uh, in a simple way, if I tell him, I tell uh, he, he was trying to unify the theory of gravity and uh, uh, quantum mechanics. There was a problem in mathematics that these two languages were not uh, were having a uh, problem, inconsistent, inconsistencies. And what he did is uh, he brought in uh, thermodynamics, especially entropy and temperature, to explain theory of gravity. And uh, that led to uh, equate uh, physics of gravity with the physics of fluids and elastic solids. That means it unified uh, both uh, these areas. And what it led to is understanding of dark energy. And this is the major contribution over series of papers he has done. And this is phenomenal for, I mean, the impact of it is that it is going to actually revolutionize theory, theoretical physics itself today. I heard him say that Development of technology has assisted research and scientists to a great extent. So you are saying that what I am saying today is things which developed in the last 15 or even five years. Yes. This was not possible during that period, before that. And he was thanking technology for that. And he said, and many of the scientific research theses are not speculation anymore. They are hard facts. Yes. So he was paying a, play, paying a tribute to the advanced technology which has come into scientific research. I thought it was rather interesting. Right, absolutely. And uh, India has done phenomenally well in the astrophysics and astro ast astronomy uh, uh, post-independence. Quite uh, significant contributions. And every year we see new and new contributions coming because of this technological development, which you mentioned, yes. Very good. Can we talk a little bit about the about the center that you are heading? What exactly we hear a lot about the center, but how was it established and what is its main function? Actually, um, uh, center had many uh, changes which happened uh, over a period of time. Uh, initially, it was thought of as a, a, a society uh, when it started off in 1990. Uh, it was thought of as an educational society or something like, uh, of that nature. And it was uh, uh, Chief Minister Karnakaran who uh, decided to uh, support it from the Kerala government and made it into a Kerala government institution under the KCSTE, uh, which uh, um, uh, had, well, that is when it was named as Rajiv Gandhi Center for Biotechnology. And uh, Professor Amar Das uh, came from CCMB uh, to establish this center. And he is the one who uh, built this uh, current uh, form of RGCB. Uh, so his contributions are significant. And towards the later part, we were finding it difficult to support ourselves from the funding which is coming from Kerala government uh, uh, they were not able to support our uh, vision. Uh, so we thought that it may be a good idea to uh, get the center's funding. And that is when we proposed with the help of the government of Kerala. And I should say Kerala, Kerala government was very supportive in this. Uh, both uh, whichever government existed, they supported us to uh, actually go for funding from the uh, central government because this had already uh, promises of becoming an extremely useful institution for Kerala society. So, uh, of course, it's a central establishment, right? Yes. Central, now, central. in 2006-2007 is when, uh, when uh, uh, Professor M. R. Pillai, uh, M. Radhakrishna Pillai, was the director. They approached uh, the uh, central government and it was uh, at that point of time that in 2007's uh, parliament budget, uh, the central government uh, announced that uh, Rajiv Gandhi Center will be taken over by the, uh, the center. And it was under the Department of Biotechnology 
uh, an institution uh, which was uh, taken up. And uh, that and was, expanded, expanded after that, more budget and more Just facilities. after that, Kerala government gave us uh, 20 acres of land uh, completely to us in Akulam campus. And uh, uh, there is a huge support which Kerala government has done for this center. Uh, it has supported uh, uh, and uh, central government has been generous in giving us funds. And today, the first phase of the uh, Akulam campus is going to be ready by the, this year end, where uh, we are going to have a super speciality facility for drug discovery and uh, imaging and various other things. Especially, uh, we are going to have a BSL-3 uh, facility, which is, which is required for uh, COVID uh, uh, kind of pathogens to be studied. So this is a new facility which is going to come in, in in Kerala. This will be the first BSL-3 facility in Kerala, which will be established uh, in... So how is it going to be different from the vaccine center, etc., we are thinking about? There well, something actually, else uh, the emphasis is different. Emphasis is different. Here, uh, since a uh, long time, uh, uh, the, the uh, healthcare system in Kerala is uh, really superb. I mean, it's uh, appreciated uh, all over India, the healthcare system in, in India. So we detect many, many viruses quite fast. And uh, RGCB from the beginning has been uh, immediately getting into studying these pathogens. So we have uh, one set of group of people who are working on uh, uh, pathogens, which include uh, viruses, uh, bacteria. Uh, parasites, various other pathogens which are affecting us. So uh, in this COVID happens to be now uh, uh, finding a center stage, but uh, sooner or later we may be getting more and more pathogens coming in. So BSL-3 facility is very, very important because it can handle airborne uh, uh, pathogens, which are basically like COVID. You, you can't even allow these pathogens to uh, go into the air. So this is a containment uh, facility where uh, you can uh, do all kinds of uh, studies on this pathogen. So this is being but set up in our Who can make that mistake, consciously or unconsciously? Right? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah, labor. Not allowed. Actually, we do not have a permission to work with COVID, uh, path, uh, COVID uh, with, without such facility for research. We cannot. Even vaccine development would be requiring these facilities. So this facility will be open for nationally. It will be open. Uh, so many other institutions can actually come and uh, use this facility also. No, but then what happens is you discover the pathogens and find out these characteristics, etc. And then the vaccine development goes to other institutions. Is that how it works? No, actually, we, we have not started vaccine uh, development here right now. But future appointments may have uh, emphasis on vaccine development because for a long time, India was ba at the uh, back end of the vaccine development. It was not able to do vaccine development. Most of the vaccines were being developed by developed countries uh, most of the times. Uh, but COVID uh, made it important that we develop our own vaccine. And today, we are able to make our own vaccines. And uh, both uh, traditional vaccines, also M uh, the latest one, mRNA uh, vaccines, are also in the making. So naturally, now we have the wherewithal. So sooner or later, we will, uh, RGCB will hire uh, scientists who would be working in the vaccine development also. But the center that we have just established was not functioning yet. And that will be exclusively on vaccine development, is that it? Uh, the it? one which is Kerala government's uh, 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 institute for advanced vac uh, vir uh, virology, yes. They have an emphasis on vaccine development, yes. But also on the study of uh, viruses, uh, pathogens itself, yes. So you will work closely with them. That's yes. It. That's so uh, in fact, uh, it is uh, uh, in indeed a pleasure that one of our faculty members is going to be uh, heading as the director of uh, uh, IAB. Oh, yes.
So that itself shows that the Kerala government has an interest to work uh, these two institutions to come together. In fact, when I was coming here, um, Professor N. K. Ganguly, who was uh, uh, been in uh, the think tank of uh, scientific I ICMR uh, and also looking at medi uh, medical research and various other things. He has been an advisor for government for a long, long time. He told me that the primary uh, thing I should do is to bring these two institutions to make it as a virology center. The Trivandrum as a center for virology studies and one of its kind. So that is what I was interested in. And now things are falling in place when you have this, uh, people who have been with us uh, heading the institutions, we can actually talk together, complement each other's effort, bring uh, uh, to, uh, projects which will be uh, putting us on the world map. It is not surprising because Kerala has now become, you know, for good or for bad, all the samples are available, you know, for yes. the virus second year. Of, and, um, you know, I remember my town, they started a coconut research station. So, so I was wondering why do you have a coconut research station here? We have lovely coconuts. And they said exactly because you have, we need a research station here, not where coconuts are not there. So, right. And also when people talk about research facilities in India, they say we need to go to India for good or for bad because everything is available. Foreign universities wanting to come to India basically because they say it is a research laboratory in the whole country. You know, right. everything is available. So Kerala is somewhat unfortunately becoming like that and it's all the more necessary for us to have all these facilities. But we have been lucky with Nipah virus, for example, not so lucky with uh, coronavirus. But I suppose this will have to be dealt with. But how is it that the pandemic was not, uh, shall we say, anticipated? Or was it anticipated or a long period of time? We had heard about, I heard a statement by President George Bush once. You know, he was talking about exactly what would happen. He said such a, such a pandemic would occur. But then his successor closed down the pandemic center. Right. In the United States. And again, President Obama talking about, you know, kind of uh, this kind of epidemic or pandemic coming. And he said, I'm very sure that this will not originate in the United States. But we will be just three hours flight from a place where this originated in a developing country. But exactly op op opposite happened. Right. These in the initial stages were more worried about flights from the United States and Italy rather than from flights from here to Europe. So it's all very complex. But did you, for example, foresee a time when such things happen, looking back at the history of science and research, like the plague and the various other things? See, actually, um, uh, one of the uh, main thing which people talk about when a pandemic happens is that uh, they thought that pandemic definitely goes through uh, developing countries. It will not affect the potential. That was the uh, logic with which people worked. So always developed countries thought that if there was a pandemic, it would be contained in the developing area and the developed area uh, countries will be able to tackle it very easily. It was the biggest surprise. The United States suffered the most. Yes. So this COVID actually taught them that it is nothing to do with the developed or underdeveloped. It is purely if you have a very weak immune system, then your population are more uh, prone for uh, attacks of such pandemics. Because and of lifestyle, you mean lifestyle? Lifestyle, yes. So More than alkaline, as some people say. If you have an alkaline life, you have better immunity. Yes. So is that, that is one thing that which uh, uh, probably is uh, the main reason why this was not thought of as... Because we have had SARS, we have had uh, MARS, but they were all contained pandemics. They, I mean, they were not... Ola, for example, was very deadly. All, all were actually localized and they could be tackled very quickly. But this was a particular uh, incidence where uh, people could not stop it from getting into really um, developed countries. And the developed countries couldn't handle it, and which was unheard of before. 
because their healthcare system is far superior their uh, ability to tackle any emergency is quite uh, high they never predicted it and it was uh, at hindsight when you look at it a population of 1.3 billion in india was less affected compared to the population which is much uh, one, fourth of it, one fourth of it it got affected much more so it it really taught us that we cannot be dependent on uh, uh, developed countries to develop vaccines so that is when india now has invested more than 1000 crores uh, or more even billions of dollars actually into uh, uh, medical field now and uh, i am sure that this is going to be the turning point for india being a leader in biotechnology sooner or later we we talk about india is the pharmacy of the world you know yes <laughs> but no we are going to go uh, go beyond that we will be developing vaccines we will be developing many other um, biotechnological tools which uh, we were not doing before because uh, we were always getting it cheaper from uh, say china or uh, from uh, developed countries now i think it has made us realize that uh, uh, self reliance is very important in these cases um, it may not be possible for us to start from scratch so make in india is the concept which is happening and uh, that is not bad for that sense would say that the chinese are partly responsible for this if they had revealed the real truths initially we are at the end of 2019 then it would not have spread so much but they were allowing the china china chinese new year to be celebrated thousands of chinese went to the united states without revealing already they were in the grip of it and people were dying in thousands and yeah. that was not revealed so even if they did not intentionally really re- re- you know leave the virus into the atmosphere but at least by uh, not letting people know the reality i think they are held responsible they should be held responsible i suppose right so uh, in fact uh, uh, that is one place where where we miss the thing even india actually didn't realize that it will be so soon that we will immediately be into the uh, pandemic uh, we were uh, under prepared in fact uh, we should really say that the government and Uh, very importantly people of the country responded uh, uh, really immediately the people of the country supported the government they came out with technologies they came out with uh, immediate uh, fixes to the problem and uh, i think it was a joint effort of uh, government and people that made it possible for us to actually be in a situation today Uh, that we can feel that we probably contained it much better uh, we don't you think it would have been more effective if the international community had worked together so having been at the united nations for 20 years my first reaction was to have uh, an international health keeping force like an international peace keeping force in fact you know wrote about it several times and some people picked them up but of course because of the chinese veto united nations security council was not even hold a meeting or to yes. speak about coordinating so if that coordination had taken place as it happened in the case of hiv aids and ebola and sars etc this would have been contained better so it was a total failure of the united nations because of the chinese veto which was responsible for this becoming you know so you know in the different countries were left to tackle themselves we try to take it up in um, sar in g20 etc but none of these mechanisms worked and everybody was left to itself and so we have so many vaccines developed in so many countries and that was a tragedy in this age and time the united nations could not deal with this effect you are perfectly correct when you say that because it should have been there that uh, all the things could have been coordinated much better and countries could have come together and we would have actually uh, had a concerted effort yeah, this But is the greatest threat to international peace and security yes. 
Absolutely. You cannot leave it to WHO. WHO is a public health organization. No, they are not uh, involved in the threat to existential threat to mankind, and that is the Security Council's responsibility. It's very sad. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that was the biggest failure because we say that the uh, United Nations prevented a third world war and so on. But this was really, really uh, disappointing. Because the death is uh, equivalent to any world war, actually equivalent. Absolutely, to. absolutely more. Yeah. Isn't it? More than a second world war deaths, I think, in terms of numbers. Because people say that the plague had also similar casualty rates. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And um, but of course, and in fact, I read somewhere that uh, there are there is there are more films and documentaries, etc., on the second world war rather than on the plague. And therefore, people have forgotten the damages of the plague, and we think only of the Second World War. Because that, if you look at the numbers, if you look at the numbers, you can always uh, statistics is a, a, a double-edged sword. You can always think in this way or that way. Uh, but what uh, we have to look at it is in a short period of time, so many people actually dying is indeed a, 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 a huge problem. Uh, over a period of time, people dying in multiple places in small numbers or large numbers uh, doesn't make an impact because it is always con concentrated in some areas. But this was pan world. Uh, it was not somebody could even say that we are perfectly all right or something. Nobody could say that. Even today, they cannot say. They cannot say that we are completely uh, secured or we are uh, safe. No, you cannot. New Zealand is a good example. They had closed down all the COVID, uh, <laughs> COVID clinics. And then one case came and locked down the whole country. And right. New Zealand is a small country. But, uh, <laughs> yes. but can we spend a little time on your speciality, Raman spectroscopy, and how it has influenced your research? I, I heard about it, but I'm, I'm afraid I didn't understand it fully. But just for the general public, how does yeah. Raman spectroscopy influence your research? And how do you apply it to real situations? Correct. So, uh, thanks for uh, pointing that out. Actually, Raman, when he discovered, it was intrigued. Uh, he was intrigued by the fact that light, when it falls on a material, in fact, uh, which uh, light makes us to see material, uh, it uh, he found that some changes is happening to the light. And that change which is happening is related to what is the constituents of the mater material itself. So, uh, in in a physics terms, it is vibrations. Okay, so the molecules actually are there, which makes the material. These molecules are not stationary; they are actually doing some vibrations, and these vibrations actually are telling about how this material is. And these vibrations are affected by the environment, by what is happening to the system, various other things. So this is a non-destructive method of testing. That means you put in a light, you can get the energy of the vibration and the energy of the vibration is related to what is happening to the system. So in a simple way, if I talk in terms of biology, you know that the proteins have various different conformations, which is like it forms a, a alpha helix, beta sheets and all kinds of things we talk about. So that brings these molecules to come together. But whenever a small change happens, that changes the property of the protein itself. And Raman can actually, from looking at the vibrations of these molecules, it can tell whether it opened up or it changed or what is happening. So I'm just telling how I use Raman in physics to Raman in biology. So this is a very uh, nice technique because it uh, it is easy to do. It doesn't require any preparation. You can do it in as is conditions in whatever place you are uh, doing it. So this makes it easy. But why is that it was not popular? Because whatever I said requires a lot of intensity of light. So the, the devices required for studying this had to be developed. And this has become more and more now possible as uh, earlier we were talking. Advancement in the instrumentation and various other aspects has made it possible for Raman to be used in uh, uh, in biology. So when he got the Nobel Prize, the real possibilities were not yet known? No. 
Actually, yeah. Raman, when he discovered it in 1928 and 1930, Raman was a visionary. He told, this is going to change the way people are uh, going to do science. He told, but nothing happened until the laser was discovered. 1960, when the laser was discovered, immediately it changed Raman spectroscopy. Till 1930 to 1960, after the Nobel Prize, nothing much was happening in Raman. But the moment the laser was discovered, it changed the way uh, people do Raman spectroscopy. Today, it has changed further because now there are miniaturization of the Raman spectrometer. Uh, you can actually take it around. Today, people are talking about if there is a pesticide on your uh, fruit, I can actually tell which pesticide is it by Raman spectroscopy because it is again looking at the vibrations of the molecule, but it tells you the significance because it is like a fingerprint. So just like you do a DNA fingerprinting, you can do it Raman fingerprinting of various molecules. But the spectroscopy means actually you pass light through a material, is that it? Uh, light onto the material, that's all. You take a laser and nowadays you don't need very intense lasers because intense lasers will actually burn material. You just need about uh, the same uh, power as the power of your uh, laser pointer. That is enough. You can actually do these uh, tests and you can control it. You can do it. So uh, this and you can uh, hold it in your hand. So it becomes a point of care uh, diagnostics. So these things have happened now and soon you will be finding that these will be entering into uh, medical field also. You know that medical field requires a lot of uh, uh, scrutiny because it uh, deals with life. But to do a pesticide study or to do a plant study or any of those things, you don't need that stringent condition. So we will see. I saw, I saw some of your slides where you are showing how you could, uh, you know, uh, recognize uh, an infected lung, for example. Right? Correct. Exactly. So, yes. so that means already in the medical field. Yeah, it is there, but it has not been approved yet uh, because it requires a lot of studies to approve it because any medical equipment needs a lot of studies because it, uh, if a wrong, see, correct evaluation is always okay, but one wrong evaluation is a, a near uh, life threatening. So okay. we don't want even 1% uh, chance of wrong detection. So this is where the technology needs to be optimized and uh, done so that the uh, today, uh, if robotic surgery has come, it took a nearly 10 to 15 years to develop that robotic te technology. Now today, every uh, surgery like uh, ear and throat, the best surgery is by the robotic surgery uh, because you don't spoil any sensitive uh, tissues at all. So similarly, the, the Raman to get into the medical field, it will require about five to 10 years of uh, development further. Um, we have not anticipated that specifically that it will be used in biotechnology. Never. Uh, C.V. Raman was uh, against chemistry, against uh, physics. <laughs> he, he, he said physics is the greatest thing. He never respected chemistry or uh, physics, but I... I so how how he, did you get interested in the Raman effect and how did you start? As a physicist, you started it. Yes, so I actually, I'm trained physicist. Uh, I used to work with uh, even uh, uh, looking at uh, the hydrogen molecule, which is what is the state of hydrogen molecule inside Jupiter. So I was actually looking at uh, those kinds of things, like what would be the state of hydrogen in uh, Jupiter. That was my Cornell University work, which actually got a huge uh, acknowledgement uh, in 1998. So that uh, was how I was trained. I was trained in really looking at condensed matter. But when I came to India, I, I, I found that I was actually doing the same things many people were doing. So I wanted to actually look at what new thing I can do. And luckily, an institution like Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research, which was actually visualized by uh, Professor Sienna Rao, it is a place where many different people come together and sit in a coffee table and discuss about their science, which is totally not related. 
so we are not compart in many universities the uh, areas are compartmentalized that means physics people will not talk to chemistry chemistry people will not talk to biology or they will be all having their own groups their large groups of people here it was a possibility that i could talk to biologist i could talk to chemist i can talk to anybody so when i was looking around i saw that biologists had lot of interesting problems where any things which they already have doesn't answer or could be modified and we could actually do something together and i could get uh, two or three very excellent uh, biologists like uh, he's uh, tapas kundu who actually is the director of uh, cdri in uh, in lucknow and uh, uday ranga uh, who is a, a one of the uh, top uh, hiv uh, research uh, research uh, researcher in the country they were with me and they were interested in knowing how can raman help and because we were talking to each other because there were a lot of uh, people working on that area and that is how i started working in 2005 uh, with them and uh, over a period of time initially uh, it was a struggle to uh, do it in india as good as what people could do abroad but today we know that we have actually the same quality or best uh, better than that and we have been leaders in some of the areas where we are able to talk about how the protein structure changes or uh, how a drug molecule uh, binds to a protein and uh, we uh, we are using uh, raman as diagnostic tools uh, which is what the patent was and uh, we are actually going forward in uh, trying to make it uh, into a commercial uh, cyst- system and uh, diagnostics and uh, looking at various aspects of uh, tissue engineering various other things uh, we are actually lo- uh, trying to take raman into so my coming into rgcb is also that that now i am smack in between biologists and i i am looking at problems where they would be interested in knowing what can i do for them so uh, we are going to develop many new uh, things so it will be uh, first time uh, biology uh, 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 in, in, in institution is going to have a raman spectrometer right inside that so this so is a type of multidisciplinary area yes uh, exactly so you are one of the pioneers of that i must say right, right. Uh, but um, uh, these two patents that you are talking about what would be the end product if it is commercialized so actually one of the patent is uh, uh, trying to get point of care raman systems which are uh, today in uh, in we we are teaching raman spectroscopy to students in msc bsc and uh, phd we are teaching raman spectroscopy because every area there is raman spectroscopy is needed but in several we, univers- in several universities or uh, all universities raman has become a very very important uh, uh, technique which needs to be taught it's a spectroscopic technique like nmr or uh, your uh, infrared or uh, esr or uh, many other microwave mass spec this is a very important technique and today uh, invasive, not, invasive uh, uh, diagnosis is that the point invasive diagnosis is not only diagnostics use of uh, raman in uh, research has become very important uh, very very important especially after the nanotechnology came uh, in 2005 lot of people have actually now requiring raman spectrometer in their lab so people are not able to even have one spectrometer or uh, a, a a raman spectrometer in uh, universities or colleges to teach h- how does this uh, work how does how does one use raman spectrometer so this is missing now today in india it's it's always very expensive they say so they don't buy it i am trying to miniaturize it and make it as good a raman spectrometer as a commercial one which will be available for people to open it up look at it try to fix it so that they learn how to use this system so that kind of a system i am making many of the But instruments you have access are, you have access to the latest technology abroad on these things because yes you know, i have uh, artificial intelligence and so on so the disadvantage that scientists like you have is you don't have that exposure like you would have in cornell university 
sitting in Trivandrum. Right. Right. So how do you make that gap? How do you fill that? So what uh, what we have done is that today I I am uh, India has invested in uh, um, in uh, science and technology quite extensively, so we are able to get the instruments which are top quality instruments uh, all over the world in India. So uh, many of the uh, latest instruments are available here. What we have done is that they we, become outdated very quickly, don't they? Yeah. They they become outdated very quickly because they no, are actually that is the good thing. If you know what the instrument is, then it never gets outdated because you know how to improve it. So my uh, knowledge from the beginning has been to open up the instrument, learn basics, not use it as a black box. So I actually open it up, learn everything. So I uh, that is how I started making my own spectrometer. When I came back from Cornell University in '98, uh, we had we used to struggle to get a, a a project for even few lakhs. We had to go to Delhi in train and defend the project, even for two lakh or three lakh projects. We we had a difficulty in getting that kind of money. So I said, why would I buy a internationally made uh, spectrometer? I will make my own. So I started making my own spectrometer. So all my research for the 15, 16 years was on an instrument which I built. So I started you building my own. Another city or another, another country does not matter to you. And uh, I actually uh, am proud to say that most of the people who sell Raman spectrometer to the country have visited my lab and wanted their system to be put in my lab. Because they would love to have a system in my lab because if they put it in my lab, everybody else would agree that that instrument is good. Because I build my own system. So I know what is the best for any research. So that is the reason why they used to visit me, they used to talk to me, they used to call me, uh, interact with me. Because I never bought a Raman system till recently. About uh, 2011 or 12 is when I first uh, thought of buying a Raman spectrometer. Till then, I used to use my own Raman spectrometer. All my results are was was built, built Raman Till spectrometer. Where was it developed? US or? You, uh, this. this was in France. It was in France uh, uh, that it was developed. There is UK company. Japan is there. Uh, so Korea is there. So U US has given it to uh, France. And uh, so I used the French uh, 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 system. But um, I, I have used uh, in Cornell uh, US system and uh, I have used Japanese system. All of those systems I have used. So I, all over the uh, world, I have been using many different systems and I actually visit all of these companies because they know that I, I understand the system. I make my own system. So they always wanted to learn, discuss and also understand what is the best uh, people would uh, use it. So I, I always okay. have been contacted. Many universities, I know, for example, in Stanford, the professor who guides research ends up having uh, startup companies. Yes. No, I know somebody, an engineer in uh, Stanford, who has 80 companies, which he has formed with, their, with his research assistants. And he is you know, getting a lot of profit from it. But the initial 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 research is done by him with his student, and then yeah. he patents it, then he commercializes it, and then yeah. you know, it becomes a, a sensation. Right. Do we get that kind of opportunities in India? Uh, actually, it, it is being uh, uh, promoted, but to start uh, a company in an institution like what they do it in the US, the ecosystem is not there. See, actually, that's what they're trying to build, I think. You are trying to build it, though. A, a professor himself cannot do that. You need a business development uh, a, a setup in a, any institution. Most of the places in US, there is a business development uh, who are actually people who understand your technology and find out what are the business uh, possibilities, and they actually work on it. As a scientist, you do not have all those ideas, how to actually take this beyond just making something. So that ecosystem, until unless is developed in India, 
uh, each institution having a uh, this business development uh, unit uh, you can't start a startup because it requires a lot of legal parts, uh, a pay, uh, IPRs, and uh, trying to do a, a, a system where people can go outside and sell things and uh, look at what are the conflicting uh, technologies, how to improve, how to be one step ahead of the others. Those kinds of things uh, come from the business level. I have seen few IITs have. Uh, at least uh, uh, something they have done, like IIT Delhi, uh, IIT Madras, have actually uh, done very nicely these things. But still, it is not up to the mark of, uh, say, Finland or uh, uh, in uh, US or any other uh, places. Well, I was in charge of Kerala higher education for a few years. And one of the things I very strongly tried to promote was interaction between the you know the corporate world and the institutions so this i had seen in the united states all the research is funded by the men at once yes they tell the university i want such and such a degree holder in five years from now and then they pay put their money where the mouths are and then the research is very easy and they know that it will be utilized by such and such company and unfortunately we don't have that kind of business this in kerala we don't have that kind of industry to be able to support this now what they happen is, you know, they come and pick up the best students from your university as a great favor to you, and they invest nothing. You know, right. if only I had done a paper and various things we tried to do, but um, we we have that disadvantage, as you said, we don't have that ecosystem established so that from research to you over to production and to commercialization in a smooth way without all these legal problems and others. Because here, if somebody starts something from a laboratory to commerce, then immediately all kinds of allegations will be made. Yes, As exactly. it happened in the case of ISRO, you may have heard about that. Yes, yes exactly. So, so immediately, <laughs> there is uh, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, charges are made and the whole thing. You need professionals, actually. Professionals doing their jobs. So, we do, see, unfortunately, in universities, there are structures. They are hard and fast. You can have professors, you can have technical officers, you can have uh, janitors, you can have these kinds of You do not have a business development executive or CEO or other things for which there you have go no to other institutions. You can send your students to an industry right. and they can come and talk to you, etc. But then it didn't work out. At least during my time, I was not able to do that. But we did a lot of work on that, this research uh, and the other thing I tried to do was to get all the research institutions in Trivandrum, for example. Right. I was surprised to find that there were at least seven or eight central and state research institutions. They all work independently, different budgets. Bring them all together and make a research, you know, innovation university. Correct. You don't need anything except put them together and vice, a vice chancellor and you'll do that. But then everybody disagrees. Right. Because they have their own vested interests, yeah, their institutions. Yeah. The major issue is the bureaucracy. That is the problem. Yeah. Bureaucracy is the problem. Everything has to be under uh, a, a, a very strict uh, uh, norms. Right. We need flexibility. Uh, that flexibility is the missing point. There are a lot of attempts. I, I should tell that over a period of time from 2005 onwards, uh, there has been an effort uh, to improvise and take into consideration these things. But as long as you are going to have government regulate every aspect of it, uh, see, actually, they can regulate, but they should not be the uh, ones to give the money and regulate. Then it becomes a problem. You do not give the money, but you regulate is fine. Because like T try or any of those things, they are actually not, they are regulating, making sure everybody is uh, all right. That is fine. But if you give the money and say that it cannot be spent in this way or it cannot be spent, you have to spend this in one year, next year you cannot spend it, all kinds of diff difficulties come when your funding is coming from the government. So Would you say the same reason why? Flexible. Is that the reason why we do not get Nobel Prizes for our scientists who are working in India? Indians uh, get Nobel Prizes only when they work abroad. Why is no, it? Actually, I should say that uh, over a period of time, our... Indian scientists have been, I mean, I, I, I have come across so many wonderful uh, discoveries and many excellent scientists who have contributed. 
It's a hundred years since we got a Nobel Prize. Uh, unfortunately, again, that is a lobby. There is, there is. I mean, I, I, sh I should say that always. People predict nowadays. The people say that who will get the Nobel Prize is being predicted today. Um, the moment you are predicting, that means you know that there is some sort of a movement which is happening, right? Which is not correct. The discovery should be, everybody should say, this discovery will get the Nobel Prize. That is how it should have been. Uh, but to, uh, it is not like that. It is always, uh, you don't know. Suddenly you will find a biology in chemistry being recognized. Um, you you give a chemistry Nobel Prize to a biologist, uh, or uh, uh, in the other uh, areas also it is a totally different area. People are getting it, so these are all uh, looked at differently. But I, I, it still is a very credible agency. It is a very credible agency. But I would say that G. N. Ramachandran lost it out Nobel Prize. He could have got it. For any time, uh, Sudarshan uh, could have got a Nobel Prize. Uh, then uh, we, uh, so you are saying these people have worked here. They have done the work here. Uh, I am not even talking about S. N. Bose and others who were before the. Uh, In Boston, yeah. I mean, they all are uh, folklores. We know that what happened in those cases. But here, this is post uh, Indi uh, independence. These are uh, people, there are many such uh, people who have contributed significantly, but they have not been able to make it because of uh, certain conditions under which we uh, are not being recognized. Even today, people don't know why G. N. Ramachandran didn't get it. I mean, everybody uses G. N. Ramachandran map for protein. Uh, if you want to understand G. N. Chandran, Ramachandran map is used, everything is dependent on that, but nobody ever bothered about it. Similarly, uh, uh, Sudarshan's uh, work, it's a yes. it's phenomenal, I actually. You are Sudarshan very well. So I'm only <laughs> immediately coming to the, my mind. There are many such, many people who have contributed. So I, yes. I do it's not agree that we are not. Bhagavad did not get the Nobel Prize. All his students are what? Huh? Yes. <laughs> so I used yes. to tell him that you will be the most well-known non-Nobel Prize winner in the world. Exactly. <laughs> There is a famous case in U.S. Uh, uh, of G. G. N. Lu uh, G. N. Lewis. G. N. Lewis is one uh, person who has, whose students all have got a uh, Nobel Prize. He was in Berkeley. He never got the Nobel Prize. But Louis Acid, Louis Bayes, uh, Lewis, Lewis' contributions are phenomenal. Now you tell me why he didn't get it. So these are things. So we should not actually, uh, we should really appreciate the science which is being done in India, Nobel Prize comes, yes, we should uh, really appreciate a Nobel Prize coming, but we are not doing that bad. There are excellent scientists who are there, they are free thinkers, they are doing it excellently. Yes, of course, there is one problem I see, which is which needs to be addressed as soon as possible in India. There is a reward and uh, funding that cycle has to be broken because everybody is now uh, geared up i should get an award so that my funding will become uh, uh, very very easy and so the as soon as a person joins a institution his only aim is to actually uh, get an award and then okay. get the next award then next award so that he can actually go up and easily get funding one of the problems I see is that large funding, and this is from the words of Professor C. N. Rao, I'm saying, funding doesn't necessarily mean that you will do great science. Hmm. You need good funding, but you need good ideas. But in the hurry to do this, impress people and get uh, awards, what you do is you find easy problems. And you try to do problems where many people are working, and so you do one more, and then you get uh, a, a acc accolade, and then immediately people say, oh, this person is really good, do it. There is no uh, fundamental, very focused, original thinking happening because of this. So that is okay. my... Uh, we'll back problem. for a moment to the COVID situation in Kerala, because that is something which everyone wants to hear. How much of an optimist are you that we are at the end of the 
second wave or third wave or whatever. And uh, do you expect, will you be able to predict that maybe say early next year we'll be, of course we may still have cases, but we may not be obsessed as much with this as we are today. What is your prognosis? Um, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, being a person who is involved in uh, the COVID uh, uh, thing, I should, again, I should mention in a short the, this thing about the uh, what RGCB is doing in the COVID. I just take a two few, few minutes to tell. We not only do research, we also do service uh, in RGCB. This is one institution which does a lot of service. So we have a COVID test from RGCB. Correct, correct. <laughs> so uh, right from March 23rd, uh, we were the accredited lab for doing uh, COVID testing. And we have been doing COVID testing for Kerala and Kerala government has been in uh, touch with us. Uh, the health department, health secretary, everybody is always in, uh, in touch with us to get uh, our help in testing in Trivandrum and Kollam. Part is taken care of by RGCB. We have done about 1.8 lakhs tests till now uh, uh, in, uh, in, in RGCB. And uh, then we also do another thing. Now we have got a mobile van from uh, Department of Bi uh, Biotechnology, which we are now uh, going to take it around in Kerala to do testing for not only for COVID, but for Nipah and other viruses also we can do the test. This mobile van is a BSL-3 facility. It can go around and uh, the Kerala government has to uh, instruct that this van has to reach such and such place. We will actually go and do that. We are training the people. We are deploying the people. And Kerala government is helping us in getting some manpower and uh, various logistics and others. So we are now doing that also. So this is uh, to address the uh, immediate control. So you, know the, you know the issue. You know the problem. Yes. So that's yes. why I'm asking you, how Correct. do you view it? So, uh, uh, so we are also doing genome sequencing to see that uh, there is no mutation okay. happening. And luckily, uh, very few mutation changes are happening. Most of it is Delta. And very few Delta Plus and a AY4 and AY3, this, uh, y uh, these are happening. So we are you watching very closely. You have we are watching very closely. So we are doing that. Now, coming to my optimism that, see, if the vaccination program, if people like, accept vaccination program, as you are uh, one of the beneficiaries of that, that the infection doesn't uh, happen too strong and then people don't have to worry about it. Vaccination is the drive. First thing is vaccination. So if the whole country, 88 la uh, crores of people are vaccinated because rest of it is uh, young population below 18. So 88 crores is sufficient to, uh, or 108, uh, if you look at it, 12 years also, 108 crores, if we can do the vaccination, uh, at least the uh, both the vaccinations, we will be protected for uh, a long time so that we will not be having any problem. This is very, very important. And that is the key. And government is doing excellently well now because we have already reached 75 crores. Uh, uh, and at least one vaccination, we have reached it. So this is something which is very, very important. So I see that the third wave is still continuing. Actually, if you would have looked at the data, it is still third wave. Major contribution is coming from Kerala, maybe. But what is, what is the uh, problem happened? There are two. This was something which was told in the beginning. And people have probably uh, overlooked that. One is you contain the uh, infection. So that means your population is insulated from anybody else. Or you allow the infection to happen so that the herd immunity happens. These are the two ways to tackle this. Kerala adopted the first one. And it actually insulated its population, didn't allow any infection to happen. When you do the zero test today, the uh, total number of people who have antibodies is less than 40% which means vaccination has not happened or infection has not happened. So these two things are not happening. So that is why the population which is not exposed to the virus is more here. So the probability of spread will be larger. But because of the good healthcare system, the death rates are very low. So the pressure on the government is not there. People are not dying too many. So we are, we are okay in Kerala. That is the problem in Kerala. 
but most of the other places herd immunity is have uh, we are closer to herd immunity or vaccination drive is good so that uh, they are above 60% or 70% of them have antibodies in that so this is the reason why the spread is lesser now in uh, many of the places and more spread is there in, in kerala but so there is so much focus on kerala people say that kerala is not doing well now you know that Actually, is the I, I, I i mean I, there are two two ways to look at it in in a sense um, if the infections are increasing but fatality is less and less hospitalization is there it can also be considered as a good way of doing it because you are actually getting the antibodies either by vaccination or by uh, infection both of them are actually giving you the antibodies or uh, your uh, immune system is getting responded to so this is this is one way to look at it of course what is the bad part of it is that if the kerala population goes to another place then they are going to have infections and they won't have a healthcare system which can protect them so that is the bad part of it but in kerala they may not be having a problem so this is one way to look at it in a positive way i'm saying negative way is that we actually are not able to implement a lockdown or uh, contain a people because already kerala has a problem of wealth most of our people are not working in companies or in offices they are work they are business people they have to sell their products if they are stopped from selling the products government will have to supplement it you know the problem now or oh, they stop so yeah otherwise they will stop so you cannot stop them from not selling their product and this is the re- this is a, a catch 22 situation if you lock down you can to speak of on 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 and elections and eat the various other things so no uh, forget the uh, i am not even looking at it. business has to happen in kerala people are all selling their things or buying their things so this is the way uh, kerala is uh, having no jobs i mean basically they don't have they, most of them are contract workers so yeah. until unless something works there will not be any job so you have to allow things to happen so if you lock down it is only going to be counterproductive until unless so government is going to prevent that new new relaxations you are you support that right, right. so uh, so that's why the relaxation is necessary and uh, so as long as you are able to control it you are able to uh, uh, not have a too serious in, uh, problem i think uh, now if you look at it in this sense we are doing better i mean i i am giving a positive twist to that yeah okay on that happy note dr chandrabas narayana for having spent some time with me to talk about science which i know very little about but it was a very enlightening thoughts that you have given us and i'm sure people who understand science would benefit from what you have just said so i say welcome to trivandrum and we look forward to your scientific experiments and your work and your recognition hopefully on top of the world Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was wonderful speaking to you. Thank you.